Um, so let's let's begin. I think we have a uh, uh, healthy uh, attendance here. I just want to welcome everybody to the fourth session in this series that we are running on behalf of the URJ, the Union for Reform Judaism, and Israel Policy Forum. It's a pleasure to partner with Israel Policy Forum, and I'm glad that we've had such rich discussions up until now. I'm looking forward to this afternoon's. Um, I'm Rabbi Josh Weinberg, and I serve as the Vice President for Israel and Reform Zionism for the URJ as the head of ARTSA, our uh, Zionist wing. Um, and uh, excited to introduce our panel, uh, Dr. Michael Kaplo and Kate Bauer, who will be with us to discuss this afternoon. Um, I just wanna say a little bit that we're framing this series of five uh, webinars, five sessions, all under the question of what needs to happen in order uh, to achieve the outcome of two states for two people, whether we call that a solution or an arrangement, uh, you know, the, the, either is fine. Um, but we know that it's not, uh, it's not looking likely that that will happen uh, in the immediate or near future. And so we want to ask the question, what will happen? What will need to be happening? What needs to happen on the ground in Israel and in the Palestinian Authority? What needs to happen in the region in the Middle East? What needs to happen in the international community uh, with support, especially from the United States and its involvement? We're asking all those questions. Um, I just want to say a note about last week that we were meant to have a webinar um, looking at specifically civil society, both um, in Israeli and Palestinian civil society. Um, and the guest that we had invited to present um, was very much caught up and involved in the events that were taking place in Sheikh Jarrah at the moment outside of her home. So uh, we felt that it was critical to postpone that webinar and we are now finding a time to postpone that and we will be back in touch with everyone um, as uh, hearing about the civil society, person to person, people to people uh, efforts on the ground is critically important uh, to this discussion. So we look forward to uh to, to to moving forward with that as well our topic today is normalization which can mean different things to different people we'll try to explore some of the uh, multifaceted aspects and meanings of that word with me to discuss is uh is kate bauer and we're uh, delighted to have you with us uh, Kate is the Blumenstein Katz Family Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Uh, she has comes from a very, very rich experience as a treasury official who served in the department's financial attache, working specifically in Jerusalem and in uh, the Persian Gulf, working with the, the PA, Palestinian Authority, um, and, uh, and has, has great experience in the area. Uh, and of course, with us is Dr. Michael Kaplow, who many of you know and have heard uh, or read uh, regularly. Uh, Michael is the chief policy officer for the Israel Policy Forum, and of course writes uh, prolifically and frequently on all of these issues. And we're looking forward to getting uh, into our discussion. I would just say that the uh, session is being recorded and we're gonna ask that everyone who has questions or comments to please put them into the Q&A section. Uh, and we will try to address as many as we can. Okay. Um, let's begin with just the basic concept of normalization. We were uh, we are now more than a year outside of the sort of historic signing of the Abraham Accords, which we uh, should understand were not peace treaties. Uh, we're not uh, you know treaties signed between two countries who were at war with uh, one with another, but they were the signing of normalization of relationships. Um, Kate. Would you begin just explain what, what, what does that word mean? What does that infer? Well, thank you very much for, for asking me to join the conversation today. I'm really thrilled to be here um, discussing this and, and with Michael as well. Uh, you know, what, what the Abraham Accords um, really meant, uh, kind of from my perspective and the, the perspective of my research and, and, and my experience, professional experience, um, is, is the opening up um, and the formalizing of relations that in many cases, especially between Israel and the UAE and um, Israel and Bahrain to a certain extent, existed um, already and had had periods in which they ebbed and flowed over the past several decades. Um, but this was a, a recognition rather than a treaty, as you said, or something that ended a conflict. It was recognition um, that had been long delayed to Israel that allows uh, the countries now to operate in the open, um, to, to deepen their ties, to, uh, to 
participate in more people to people exchanges. I was actually in the Gulf just a couple of weeks ago um, in the UAE and then uh, took advantage of the direct flights and uh, flew from Dubai to Tel Aviv um, and saw these, you know, movement of people uh, just in this direction, primarily uh, for now from, from the UAE to Israel because Israel has had um, more constraints on entry due to the pandemic and things like that. Uh, but from my perspective, having uh, worked both in Israel and in the Gulf, um, it's, it's the, the uncovering of ties that were there, the opportunity to deepen them, the opportunity to expand them, um, and uh, to work also um, on things that are, I know we're going to get into how this ties back to helping the Palestinian Authority, to work on issues of mutual interest um, and on lines of activity where they have shared interests that are separate from the Palestinian portfolio, frankly. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. Very well, thank you. And uh, at some point, I'd love to hear more about your experience, you know, on the ground there and what you saw, you know, with your specific lens uh, there. And uh, you know, who else was on that flight back and forth with you? But we'll get to that in a second, Michael. If I can, if I can turn to you. Um, and of course, if you, uh, for, you know, for our participants, if you're not aware, uh, Michael was the key author, along with uh, Dr. Shira Thon and Evan Gottesman, of a recent report called New Normal, um, Arab-Israeli Normalization and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. Um, if you haven't read every word of this report yet, I mean, it is, you know, uh, scintillating. And uh, no, it, it is, a, is a very serious report. And thank you for putting in the chat right there so everyone can... Um, can uh, can access it and begin to report. Um, I, I wanna I wanna turn to you, Michael, to explain a little bit about how sort of this sort of turned the Kerry doctrine, the John Kerry doctrine, on its end. And when when Kerry was Secretary of State of the United States, I think the basic contention was that there could there could not be an advancement towards the two state solution or towards two states. Um, uh, with you know, before there could not be you know relationships with other players, other countries in the region until Israel reconciled and came to some sort of final status arrangement with the Palestinians. And this came and said you know the exact opposite. Um, so how should we understand that? And to say um, just to build on what Kate said, is that I know we want to talk about how this will help the Palestinian Authority, but I'm also looking at how it will actually help both. And how will it advance, you know, you know, peace or rapprochement um, in in you know in Israel Palestine? Um, Michael. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Josh. And uh, great. Always great to be here with you, RJ, and uh, and of course, great to be alongside Kate. So, as you referenced, the uh, um, there was the sense before the Abraham Accords, and you know it's associated with uh, with John Kerry from his time as Secretary of State, but I, I think it you know dates dates to uh, before that as well. Um, the sense that there could be no normalization between Israel and other states in the region without uh, an Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement, and that really comes from the Arab Peace Initiative. Which is uh, an initiative that was that was first uh, floated by the Saudis and then adopted by the Arab League in 2002, um, and the premise there was precisely that: that normalization with the region would be the reward for Israel if it were to sign a permanent status agreement uh, with the Palestinians. And you know, for, for someone like Secretary Kerry, I'm not sure that that was necessarily a, a normative preference. I think, I think he was largely reflecting um, the messaging that was coming from the region and the traditional messaging on the Arab-Israeli conflict coming from Arab states. A few things changed um, that really made the Arab Peace Initiative no longer the, the dominant paradigm or, or dominant framework. Um, you know, one of the things that changed was the increasing threat from Iran. Um, you know, if we think about uh, what the situation was in 2002 versus what the situation was in 2020, uh, it was very different. And not only is the Israel's threat perception with regard to Iran, which had always been present, but you know, steadily increased uh, over time, particularly particularly following uh, the 2003 Iraq War. Um, but the perception of Sunni states in the region about Iran and its nuclear program and its, its malignant activities throughout the region 
changed as well. And as those as those escalated, uh, and as you really had this coalition of Israel and Sunni states that were focused on Iran and the threat from Iran, it pushed them together in ways that uh, that I don't think we'd seen before. And so you had uh, these largely under the table, but pretty robust security relationships that already existed between Israel and Sunni states, and, and particularly between Israel and the UAE. Um, Second, I think that uh, there has been lots of increasing frustration that has bubbled to the surface among Sunni states with the Palestinians. Um, you know, there, there, was a, there was a period of decades where in a lot of ways, Sunni states uh, foreign policy with regard to Israel uh, and even with regard to the United States um, was held, uh, I don't want to say held hostage, but um, was was very much influenced by the cause of Palestinian nationalism. And I think that over time, some of these Sunni states uh, either became frustrated with Palestinians and Palestinian leadership, or decided that uh, interests were, were going to trump ideology. Um, and third, you know, just to just to wrap Someone it up. Said about that, just to, would you agree that they've, you know, often the cliche is that they have they're very good for the Palestinian cause, but not good for the Palestinians themselves. You mean the, the you mean the Sunni the Sunni Arab states? Right, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think I think that's I think that's certainly fair in a lot of ways. Um, and third, you know, we've seen Israel's economy uh, under uh, primarily under Prime Minister Netanyahu in his twelve years in office. Um, we've seen Israel's economy really explode, and that meant that the benefits of having normalized relations with Israel. Um, increased every single year. And these states were really uh, leaving aside the Palestinian angle. You know, these states that wanted to have greater trade relationships with Israel um, were actively, actively losing out by not having, by not having so. And so um, I think that the, the theory behind uh, this notion that, that things had to be inside out, um, meaning you start with the Israeli-Palestinian piece of it, and then you move out towards the region, you know, the theory, the, or the interest behind that Really shifted toward a more outside-in approach, which is you start first with the region, and then and then you move to uh, to the Israeli-Palestinian angle. And so I think all those things contributed, you know, to uh, to sort of the uh, the implosion of this narrative um, that uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace had to come first. Yeah, I appreciate the broader perspective of looking at multiple factors that lead into to this. And Kate, did, do you want to respond? And does it like you know how how are you seeing this from from your point of view? I, I agree. I think Michael hit um, on the on on a lot of the different dynamics, um, and I think that there there has been in recent years this um, uh, kind of joint interest or joint concern about the Iranian threat. Um, but I think that, uh, and this is especially what I was hearing when I was in the region, was that uh, that we shouldn't see the Abraham Accords um, as being defined as an anti-Iran coalition. Um, some of that uh, is, is, is messaging, but I, I, you know, I do think that there's a lot more going on and that the, the states involved want it to be a lot deeper than just an anti-Iran coalition. And of course, it's very interesting that in, we've seen within the past couple of weeks that a senior Emirati official went to Iran. Um, so I think there, there is this broader context, uh, if you're looking at Emirati policy in particular, of de-escalation throughout the region, and they would put uh, normalization with Israel as part of that. So, you know, the, mm -hmm. the UAE leader has gone to, to Turkey recently, you had his brother go to Iran, you have normalization with Israel. Um, they, they are pursuing broader de-escalation um, there. Uh, but I think there's, there's both the, the, the sense of the threat from Iran that has been a force driving them to work more closely, especially on the defense and security side, but also this sense that the US um, is withdrawing from the region. Um, and the, the sense that the U.S., uh, you know, the pivot to Asia, that uh, the U.S. is not as invested, not as reliable of a partner. I think the, the, the big shifts in policy that we've seen from administration to administration over the last several years um, yeah. has led Arab, Arab Gulf states, Sunni states to, 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 you know, realize more that the U.S., um, that they can't necessarily count on U.S. policy continuity. Um, and so they're trying to take it more into their own hands. And that really involves uh, strengthening relationships in the region 
Um, so in that sense, it is about building a regional coalition, but not necessarily solely an anti-Iran um, coalition. Can, can I just ask you on that? Like, how, how have you seen that change with the change in the American administration? You know, is that, is, is there a different or is it a progression um, sort of not, not to compare the two, but the Trump administration doctrine you know, of some isolation and some we're not going to get involved. And then now Biden's approach, how, how have you seen that shift? Well, I think that, and I, I, I'd like to hear Michael's uh, sense of this as well. I think that the perception um, in the region isn't entirely aligned with reality. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there's a perception that the U.S. is is withdrawing, and of course, there's the impact of the withdrawal from Afghanistan as well. Um, that this is the example that everyone can point to and say, "Well, look what what happens there." Um, so, I, I I think that there's you know, there's a perception that um, needs to be actively countered. And I think the Biden administration is trying to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, one, one thing, if, if I kind of had to sum up the feeling in the region when I was there, um, you know, there was a commitment to the U.S. as a, as a long-term partner, but that the partner's attention is elsewhere right now. And I think, you know, the Biden administration came in with many domestic challenges as well, and then has had the withdrawal from Afghanistan, um, you know, a focus on China, et cetera. And I think that's, that's being felt. There's also a global pandemic that we may be dealing with and uh, as well. My Michael, do you want to add anything there? Do you wanna yeah, I would, just, I would just quickly follow up on that. Um, I, you know, I, I agree with what Kate said. I think that there's, so first, there's, a, there's certainly a difference between perception and, and reality. And I think that the perception in the region um, very much uh, out, outstrips the reality. You know, the, the United States is never going to withdraw from the region entirely. Um, you know, we're always going to be deeply invested. Um, so, you know, that's one. Two is, I'm not sure that the, I'm not sure that the, the relevant frame is necessarily the shift from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, because we're now really in the third consecutive administration that has openly talked about, you know, whether it's a pivot to Asia, whether it's, you know, America first, um, whatever, whatever it is, this is the third consecutive president who has openly um, spoken about shifting resources and shifting priorities and shifting focus away from the Middle East. Um, so I think this is part of a, a longer a longer trend. And um, you know what, what Kate noted uh, in terms of particularly Emir the Emiratis recently um, trying to uh, trying to patch up relations with Iranian the regional people. broker kind of. Yeah. Right, and to and to and perhaps you know make it make it seem as if they're not um, necessarily uh, forming an an anti an anti Iran coalition. Um, you know that is that is in, in large measure I think a response to now a years long perception that the U S may not be there and you know sort of classical classical international relations theory right there's balancing and bandwagoning and I think a lot of these countries are now bandwagoning with Iran because they perceive the U.S. exiting the region. And whether we are or we're not, and as I said, I don't think we are, the perception is certainly important and is going to drive their behavior. Yeah, and I think there's a big question of where, where, where does that leave Israel uh, in terms of also, you know, lots of discussion in the news and, and uh, Defense Minister Gantz has, you know, just uh, made the rounds in Washington as well, uh, you know, talking about should Israel left on its own to deal with Iran. Not necessarily the topic of our discussion today, and I and I, I want to bring it back to Israel Feldman. But I think you know, as we're looking at it, I think that's that's a that's a big question. Um, just just to bring it back to you know Israelis and Palestinians, um, you, you know, you, you both shared lots of different factors that went into the Abraham Accords and normalization of relationships, and it may look a little bit different. Um, from one country, you know, what the UAE is concerned with may be different than Sudan or Morocco or, you know, there's, there's but um, it was not a secret that Israel had relationships with you know, UAE for, you know, 25 years, whatever. And a lot of people asked the question, okay, so why now? Was it, you know, because of the, who the leaders were at the time, Netanyahu and Trump, or is as um, the direct reason that was given publicly um, was that we went into a normalization agreement with Israel in order to prevent uh, the proposed annexation of, so we don't know exactly what was going to happen, uh, but as a reaction to Israel proposing to annex uh, certain areas of the West Bank. Um, and then, so if so, how do we think about that? And how do we think of 
you know, continued settlement, you know, building or, you know, new projects being approved um, a year later with, uh, you know, it, it, does that have any effect whatsoever on the relationship with um, the new normalized uh, countries? I can, I'll, I'll throw it out I, to both, you know, the, the, uh, yeah. I, I can I can start with this one. Um, yeah. So you know this this subject is very much in the news this week with uh, Barack Ravid's uh, new book and, and podcast yeah. and reporting um, about how the the failure of the Trump peace to prosperity plan uh, led directly to the Abraham Accords, um, and he focuses on on the desire of the United States to stop Israeli annexation uh, at the same time that the Emiratis had, had come to the, the same conclusion on their own. Um, so I think certainly, you know, annexation and the threat of annexation drove the timing in part. Um, you know, of course, uh, the stars were aligned in many other ways, and obviously the, the momentum had been pushing in the direction of normalization before annexation, um, even if annexation uh, and stopping annexation you know, uh, provided a, a kind of a, a handy a handy lever for it to happen then. Um, but you know, Ravid also <laughs> also reported what was probably one of the the worst kept secrets uh, among among DC analysts, which is that um, normalization in return for stopping annexation was uh, unofficially a, a three year a three year commitment. Um, and so, I don't think that particularly on the, the Israeli-Emirati part of this, that relationship is very strong and it's extremely robust. And you know, trade between the two, two countries has exploded and there's lots of logic to that relationship um, you know, to the point that it's difficult, I, I think, for anything to derail it. Um, even if Israel were to, two years from now, annex 30% of the West Bank, which was what was contemplated in the Trump plan, Trump plan right, yeah. very, very difficult for, for me to see a scenario in which the Emiratis would say, "Okay, we're you know canceling normalization," um, and you know there's also not much evidence so far that the Emiratis are particularly concerned with settlement expansion, settlement activity, um, or really much of anything going on in the West Bank. So I, I think that you know that that Israeli-Emirati relationship in particular is largely immune to developments within the Israeli-Palestinian sphere. Um, I'm not sure the same can be said uh, with regard to Israel and Morocco. You know, of course, Israel and Morocco actually had started down the normalization path back in the 90s, and then it was suspended in 2000 uh, during the Second Intifada. Um, so, right, there was that historic case when, when Rabin, you know, stopped in Morocco on the way back, uh, you know, from from signing the Oslo Accords, right? Was, right. Um, so, so even you know, historically, there's 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 evidence for. Um, for Israeli-Palestinian issues impacting that relationship more, and and you know I, I certainly wouldn't be as confident that that relationship is immune to developments in the Israeli-Palestinian sphere. Um, so I think it really depends on a country by country basis. But if we're talking about the core of this, which is really Israel UAE, I think that that relationship is is pretty much uh, pretty 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 much as solid as it gets. Yeah, and, and Kate, what's your sense of this specifically? If I, I just want to build on that and feel free to comment on anything that, you know, that, that Michael said, of course, and just to say, you know, you, you spent lots of time working with the Palestinian Authority. And my sense was that the Palestinians um, were not, I'll, I'll put it you know, mildly, you know, were not uh, dancing in the streets uh, with, the Abraham, with the signing of the Abraham Accords and you know, almost felt betrayed. Uh, you know, how could you normalize relations with Israel, who we still see as an occupying force? Um, wh wh where, where do you see the Palestinian street uh, a year later? And have they warmed up to also possibly benefiting from, uh, you, know, from you know, financially, economically from, uh, from this normalization, um, especially if it stayed off, you know, annexation, you know, who knows? Um, well, anything you're hearing there? So I, I think it's interesting to, to, to look at the question of, of where is the street, what is, what is public opinion? I feel like this is um, a question that I've gotten in the context of, of, of the Accords, um, not necessarily the Palestinian street, but um, you know, the, the kind of uh, lack of public support in the Gulf. And I think in, in Michael's report, the authors do a good job of, of kind of explaining 
um, you know, why that is, that is one of the things that this decision was taken by golf leaders, despite the fact that they knew it would be unpopular. Um, but uh, one of my colleagues, David Pollack at the Washington Institute has done a lot of polling in the Arab world. And uh, I think it's, it's interesting. So I, I think that the, the most recent polling was that 44% in the UAE support the Accords. Um, so there's a majority that don't, uh, but that, that roughly aligns with, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, uh, focus on how the recent conflict in Gaza um, might disrupt some of the progress um, uh, under normalization. And uh, the 44% that support is, is roughly the same as the amount that supported the, the Hamas in that conflict, which was 41%. Um, so, so you, you know, you have, you have, um, you have societies in, in the Gulf, I think that, uh, you know, that, that both, uh, you know, want to see progress on the, on the Palestinian file, uh, but you have declining support for both Hamas and the PA over time. Um, and, and, and that's part of the challenge, uh, I think, by the, you know, among the UAE as well, is, is uh, that I think it's, it's Michael said, or, or, or uh, maybe you said is the introduction that the, yeah, um, you know, there's increasing frustration over time um, with the Arab Sunni states in the Palestinian leadership. Um, and that that makes it a challenge, I think, for them to find a way to engage in the territories um, uh, in a way to use the accords um, as an entry point to, to, to work with the PA. Um, yeah. and, 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 and so that is, that is part of it. Um, I think that first the focus is on deepening the bilateral relationship Israel-UAE, um, but I, I I do think that there's interest in doing more, um, and there are definitely possibilities of ways that the that the Gulf states could engage more um, in the territories. But I do think that they were stung by the response of of, of the PA, as you said, the Palestinians weren't um, dancing in the streets. They um, they did uh, close embassies and and um, uh, protest diplomatically to this, uh, and I think the Emiratis feel as if. Uh, you know, they, this, this was a decision that was, uh, you know, it, it was uh, part of the accords was getting Israel to commit to, to not annexing at that time. Um, and that if, if the deal wouldn't have gone forward, that we would be talking about a very different situation. And so I think that it did sting them that that was the response that they got um, and that it's going to take time for them to find where those opportunities are. Um, and we can we can talk about those in in more detail. Um, I think I'll I'll leave it there for right now. <laughs> oh, no, that, that that that's great and 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 uh, but fascinating numbers by the way that I, I I was not aware of and and that you know I think I think that's that, that says a great deal um, about you know if there's any you know dissonance between the population and the leadership and and and, and all that 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 that's uh, you know that's astounding. Um, let, 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 let's zoom out a little bit, no uh, pun intended here, but to ask what, uh, how, how do we see this in sort of a longer term strategy of how these Abraham Accords and the normalizations with um, Arab countries, potentially Muslim countries, Gulf states, you know, regional players, um, which, you know, I, I do wanna ask if we think that there will be more of that or if this was a one-time shot. Um, I think that the elephant in the room, uh, or you know, uh, you know, Michael, you refer to it as the big prize, uh, is of course, you know, the Saudis and 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 where they come in in this. But let's let's ask the question about you know how can this help <laughs> further, whether it's going back to the table or whether it's um, an influx of dollars into the Palestinian economy. How can this help further um, reconciliation, negotiation, um, and the situation between uh, Israelis and Palestinians? Michael, do you want to you jump in and then we'll go back sure. to you? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to understand that, you know, uh, uh, kind of as the foundation, that um, the, the logic behind the Abraham Accords for pretty much all the parties involved um, was to not let the Palestinian issue get in the way. 
Um, for the Israelis, this was this was great, right? Prime Minister Netanyahu, or former Prime Minister Netanyahu, you know, has been talking about outside in for decades. Um, and you know, I think for him, this was sort of this was evidence that uh, that he was that he was right in the end that you didn't need Israeli-Palestinian peace to get Arab states on board. Um, for the Arab states, as I said before, they had all sorts of incentives to have a relationship with Israel, and they didn't want it um, held captive uh, by the Palestinian issue. Uh, and for the United States at the time, under the Trump administration, um, I think this was this was a way to to make up for the the failure of the of the Trump peace plan that was really dead on arrival. Um, so for for this to have progress on the Israeli-Palestinian front, um, these incentives need to change. And I'll also add, by the way, uh, that for the Palestinians themselves, you know, who were who were left out. Um, their initial, you know, as, as, as we've spoken about, their, their initial response was, this is a complete betrayal, we want nothing to do with it. And so I think that, you know, the way out of this is to convince everyone that it is in their interest to include the Palestinians. Um, and, you know, the way that that will, I mean, there, there are a few ways that that can happen. Um, one of them is for the countries involved, you know, Israel and, and, the, and the other Abraham Accord signatories, to come up with projects that can involve the Palestinians, because you know, in doing so, it will benefit the Palestinians, but it will also help reduce the barriers on the Palestinian side um, to engaging in, in this normalization process and engaging in the Abraham Accords. The Palestinians right now view this as something that has had no benefit to them. And so if they start to see some benefits, you know, that is a way of reducing uh, for preventing annexation, which yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, well, they they view that as certainly a benefit, but it's something that you know they didn't they didn't want to happen anyway, right? It's you know it's like somebody somebody puts a gun to your head and then takes it away. You're not necessarily going to thank them for taking it away. Um, so you know, I, I think I think one way is to is to try to convince the Israelis and uh, and these other states to include the Palestinians. You know, there I'll note that there was a missed opportunity very recently. Um, which was the three-way deal between Israel, Jordan, and the Emiratis um, uh, for, for, it's basically a, a, a water and energy deal um, whereby you build solar arrays in, in Jordan um, and uh, desalination plants and uh, the, Emiratis, the Emiratis fund it and get some of the electricity. Um, you know, this would have been an opportunity to include the Palestinians um, in some component of it. And, you know, I would hope that going forward with these types of projects, Palestinians are included um, for this reason, to benefit them, just, you know, A, to benefit them for quality of life, um, but B, to, to start to reduce some of the, some of the barriers uh, around Israeli-Palestinian issues within, within the context of normalization. But at the end of the day, I also Can think. Ask you that, but what, what, why do you think? Why do you think they weren't included? You know, for instance, you know, we know Eco Peace in the Middle East has presented its blue green deal um, for, you know, which, which is a you know Israeli Palestinian Jordanian initiative for water, um, and you know Jordan has enough sunshine and desert to supply solar energy to you know, well beyond its own means. Um, wh wh why do you think they didn't include the Palestinians in that? I, I'm. I mean, I'm curious if Kate, if Kate has a has a view on this. Yeah. My view is that uh, it's 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 almost it's almost entirely political. Um, the UAE right now, for you know, we can we can go into the nitty gritty, but for for a variety of reasons, uh, the UAE doesn't want to do very much that will help uh, current Palestinian leadership and the Palestinian Authority. Um, and from the Israeli side. You know, we have seen some willingness to help the PA and, and strengthen the PA, particularly from uh, Defense Minister Gantz. Um, but I'm not sure that uh, Prime Minister Bennett or, or some of the other ministers in the government necessarily want to include the PA right now in any sort of high profile deals or agreements. Um, so, you know, changing, changing these incentives is hard. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that it's important, particularly for the United States, um, to push all of these parties to shift their behavior a little bit um, and to try to reconceive of the Abraham Accords, not as something that purposely leaves the Palestinians out, but as something that can include the Palestinians, you know, in, in a whole bunch of areas. Yeah. Okay, Kate, you, can, can we ask you to, to chime in on that? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I agree with Michael. I think, I think he uh, uh, described it well. I, you know, I, yes, I, I think the UAE is reluctant to, to bring the PA into things right now. 
Um, as I said before, I think they want to focus on on deepening their relationship with Israel and bringing in, for now, third parties that can help bridge that, uh, rather than um, you know one that would, would complicate the relationship at this point. Um, you know, I, I think that that in Jordan is a perfect example of that, and I think you will see the UAE continue to seek out third parties and other locations where they can work with Israel and someone else. Whether it's you know you've been hearing a lot lately about UAE Israel India um, or you know what the US UAE and Israel can do together as well. Um, I think the challenge in finding uh, where the interests overlap, as Michael said. Uh, you know, there's there's a desire in, from certain parts of, of the Israeli government to, to bolster the PA, um, and that's not exactly what the UAE wants to do, perhaps. But there is, I think, an interest um, in in trying to you know improve the quality of life for the Palestinian people, support the Palestinian economy, um, and and where do those things overlap, and and how can you find projects? And I, I do think it may be too early to do this now. Um, in a way, it creates an opportunity to see if the, the broader political dynamics can shift a little bit. And I agree that it's something the U.S. Um, should be pushing on. But the U.S. also, um, you know, is just resuming its assistance relationship uh, with the West Bank and Gaza after it had been cut off under the Trump administration. Um, and just really resuming, you know, direct uh, uh, ties with the, the, the PA as well. Um, but finding, finding where there are opportunities um, for Gulf investors to come in and, and help support the Palestinian economy, even if it's not a trilateral agreement in a way, I think is also a possibility. Uh, when I worked over there in 2010, there was an investment conference um, in Bethlehem. And uh, what I recall is the biggest challenge was the logistical challenge of getting Gulf investors, uh, you know, visas to come in and um, leaving them with the impression that it would be very hard to, to, to put money in something where that's always going to be the case. And that obstacle is gone now. Um, so I do think that there is an opportunity to do that. Um, it, it, it just, I think, is going to take a little bit of time. With the, I do think the pandemic has slowed things down. Um, I do think that, as you said before, you asked who else was on that plane with me when I was flying out of the UAE. It was almost exclusively Israelis. I do think the people to people portion of this is very important. Uh, a certain aspect of the business to business is just going to take off um, because of the, the business communities in both of these countries. But part of it as well is, is, uh, is by expanding that to more SMEs, et cetera, will be giving the people to people the SMEs that we, yeah. small, small and medium enterprises will be yeah. you know, expanding, I think, some of the direct contact as well. Yeah, uh, no, that, that that's fascinating, and 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 I, you know, I, I think the more, I mean, there's two ways to look at it. That you know, as we're used to this, there will be more people-to-people -people interaction, and on the other hand, and and I get that it's a totally different uh, circumstance, but you know, in the 40 some years since there's been a peace agreement with Egypt, um, we have not seen an influx of Egyptian tourists come into Israel. It's more, you know. Israelis going to Sinai and uh, and, and the like, um, and there's great pressure within Egyptian society to not do that, of course. Um, but and I, I want to use that as a comparison to the Palestinians and to think about the term normalization in a broader sense. Um, in that, you know, what would it take to actually normalize relationships with uh, with with the Palestinians? Um, would that need to be a two-state outcome? Um, or, you know, often when we hear Palestinians speak about um, any efforts for whether, you know, it's collaboration with Israelis or working together or joint projects or acknowledgement of the other's existence, um, you know, th there is some pressure to say, let's not do that because of normalization, normalization uh, which is seen as, as a bad thing for the Palestinians because it would normalize essentially the status quo in which there is an occupation. Um, and so how do we see that? And, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna frame that with two questions that came into the chat, essentially. You know, would, would Palestinians, one, one from uh, Mark Hager and the other from Liam Weintraub, is you know, would the Palestinians accept opportunities, do you think, to do business with Israel, even if it was so, you know, trilateral or multilateral, you know, with including other, you know, with UAE, Bahrain, and you know, where are the Qataris on this, 
Um, and and would would that result in then strengthening Hamas in the region? Um, and then there's another question about the educational, uh, you, you know, content of, of the Palestinian Authority, which which we can get to in a minute. Um, I think that that's probably you know enough for me to stop and to ask you all to weigh in on the question of normalization of the Palestinians and 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 how could how could the Abraham Accords help foster some of that. Um, you know, at least economic activity and, and, and interdependence, let's say. Michael, can we, can we turn it back to you? Can we, sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Sure. So if you, look at, if you look at Israel's relations throughout the region, um, you see something that's not surprising, which is that in a place like the UAE, where there was no, there was no fighting. There was no state of war. There was no, you know, actual uh, conflict between Israel and the UAE. Um, normalization with Israel tends to be less controversial than it does in places like Jordan and Egypt, where there have been peace treaties for decades, and yet those are probably the two countries where Israel is the least popular um, because of the legacy of uh, a fighting in war. And then you go to the Palestinians, where there is this very strong idea of anti-normalization, right? Don't do anything to normalize or legitimate uh, legitimate relations with Israel, um, where Israel is for Palestinians, the occupying power. Um, and so I don't think anybody should be surprised that under the current conditions, there is a very strong sense in Palestinian society that you shouldn't be doing anything to help Israel or legitimate Israel. Remember that when Palestinians look at Israel, um, they don't necessarily see an actor that is helping them. They see an actor that, in their view, is occupying their land. Sure. Um, so, so long as that situation continues, um, I don't think that we can really expect Palestinians to turn around one day and be grateful to the Israelis for, for all sorts of things. With that said, there, is, there are plenty of examples of Palestinians engaging with Israel economically. We see it between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, where you do have things like, uh, like joint water projects. You know, people may remember early on in the Trump administration in 2017, Jason Greenblatt uh, attended a, a, a ceremony that was highly touted by the Trump administration, uh, which was a, a, a water deal that uh, the Trump administration had helped to broker between Israel and the PA. Um, in addition, you have about 160,000 Palestinians who uh, work in uh, either in Israel proper or in uh, settlements in the West Bank um, every single day. These are 160,000, 170,000 Palestinians who are employed by Israelis. Um, yeah. and, you know, you also have things like uh, industrial zones and, and economic zones. So, you know, the, the idea that Palestinians will out of hand reject any type of economic activity with Israel there's no evidence for that, right? In fact, the evidence is to the contrary. But if we're talking about political attitudes and sort of acceptance of Israel, not saying, okay, great, I'll, I'll take a job, but, um, but actually accepting Israel as a legitimate entity, uh, I, think it's, it's, I think it's naive to think that that will happen so long as the current situation persists. There it's will have to be something well, very different, yeah. which, you know, from my point of view, has to be a two-state outcome. Um, but that's what will shift it. And anyone who thinks that um, Palestinians will shift their attitudes absent that, I think will be waiting a long time. Yeah. And for those of us who watch the Israeli news uh, on a regular basis, um, just to build on, you know, Michael, you commented that there were 160,000 Palestinians making their way either into Israel or into Area C, let's say, uh, for, for work. The Israeli nightly news did a um, for a few days in a row, did a feature of following these workers uh, coming and you know watching them you know walk through holes in the fence uh, or a wall where it is a wall you know and going into and, and, and it was a fast it was a bit sensationalist but um, you know fascinating nonetheless uh, about how that can you know and most people are saying listen we just want to work we just want to you know you know bring bread home at the end of the day. Uh, and, and be able to feed our families, which you know which we can't do right now. So we'll be happy to do that. Um, it, Kate, I want to you know get your take on this, and I just want to add one other you know major element, and that is Gaza uh, right now. In that you know it's not a secret that Gaza is 
whether it is already or borderline a humanitarian disaster right now, overcrowdedness, terrible to you know, access to water, electricity, um, that each time there's a conflict, it takes a very long time to rebuild um, buildings that have been destroyed, so on and so forth. Um, there have been different plans over the years to sort of rehabilitate Gaza or to completely, you know, and, and I know that you know, the foreign minister and alternate prime minister, Yair Lapid, has a, has a plan. I know that he spoke about that with Sisi of Egypt uh, the other week. Um, could, could the Gulf states now with their normalization just underwrite that whole thing? And, and, and what would prevent them from doing so? And wouldn't we want to see that um, you know, we know that the Qataris often deliver suitcases full of cash uh, straight to you. What are what are what are some obstacles to that? And what do you think? Um, you, you know that they would have uh, that, that 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 would be their impetus for for doing such a thing. Yeah. So if if I could just say first on the on the labor issue, um, mm -hmm. I think this is a really important one. Um, to, to, to emphasize and to point out to people who don't, who might not be aware of, of how big the numbers are and that Israel has continued to increase the number of permits for Palestinians coming in to work in Israel as the economic situation in the West Bank has deteriorated. Um, and the fiscal situation of the PA right now is, 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 is quite um, uh, perilous. Uh, and you know there's concern about the PA being able to continue to, to pay wages. Um, pay salaries, and so it's important that this, it, you know, that the labor is coming and, and bringing that those funds back into uh, the West Bank and also Gaza. Actually, um, it's my understanding that the Israeli news has covered this as well. That what have been called businessman permits, which allowed Gazan traders to go into Israel, um, are now have been expanded to the extent that it's a that it's an open secret that there are laborers coming in from Gaza to Israel as well working um, you know, in primarily agricultural work um, uh, and, and returning to Gaza sometimes after weeks or months of working in Israel. So for both economies, the idea that these are economies that if you go back 10 or 20 years, were very tied in huge amounts of labor, much larger amounts of labor coming into to Israel um, that are now have been isolated. It's really important. Um, and there's clearly a recognition uh, you know, by Israel that it's important that it do these things as well. Um, right, on, and in the meantime, Israel has brought in tens of thousands of uh, foreign workers from Romania, Thailand, China, you know, from different places to replace that, and it seems uh, it's like a total missed opportunity. Yeah, yeah it, it, I mean, there's in, there's an interesting um, one as well. Israel recently announced that it was going to do a pilot of providing permits for uh, highly skilled Palestinians um, in 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 the tech industry to work in Israel proper, um, and this would be different. I mean, you've had opportunities kind of for collaboration uh, with Palestinian firms, but this would allow Palestinians as permitted workers to come in and really work in that ecosystem and the Israeli kind of, you know, startup nation ecosystem. And I do think this is one area where there's an opportunity considering how much of the UAE Israel um, uh, uh, activity right now is focused on tech and fintech and startups and you know, startup nation, and then the UAE wants to be scale-up nation, of, of trying to, to bring the UAE in, in some way, the private sector in, you know, you, you do have highly skilled Palestinians who can apply for these, these permits. Um, and I think it's going to be, this is a, a, a pilot program. So hopefully there's going to be demand and it's a program that'll continue. Um, but there is a need for, uh, you know, Palestinian uh, students to be able to have experience working in these ecosystems before they might get a job like that. Um, so can they go work in the UAE, do internships, things like that? Um, could, the, could these tie-ups between Israeli uh, tech and, and UAE tech um, try to do some of that on their own, um, I think would be an interesting area. That's just kind of an aside. Um, on Gaza, you know, what could the, could the Gulf states underwrite things there? And I think you see some really interesting um, things going on after the most recent conflict in Gaza, where you saw uh, since the, the, the rift in the Gulf has, you know, this was where uh, the, where the UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt um, were boycotting Qatar since that has been um, resolved. 
you saw really more direct coordination between Qatar and the UAE and Egypt um, in, in trying to broker the ceasefire there. And in, at the conclusion of the conflict, um, uh, you saw the UAE, or I'm sorry, Egypt and Qatar uh, both commit to providing $500 million for, for reconstruction in Gaza. Um, you know, whether or not that, that money uh, materializes, especially on the Egyptian side, um, you know, where is that going to come from? Is that, is it, what is it exactly that they're committing to do? I think still, it, it's a little bit clear, but it remains to be seen. It's still a very interesting change there to see that direct cooperation because the cutter has been uh, put, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into Gaza over the last several years um, in coordination with Israel and, and will continue to do that. Um, but to see Egypt also, you know, coming in and, and looking to, 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 to be involved in reconstruction, potentially with the financial backing of the UAE um, is, is an interesting change. There are a lot of political dynamics, um, uh, some of them somewhat historical that make it difficult uh, to imagine the UAE taking a direct role working in Gaza. Um, and, uh, um, and there's also this issue of not wanting necessarily to work through the PA. So concern about, you know, always wanting to see the PA um, as, as a conduit for support for, for assistance and reconstruction in Gaza. That's kind of the US policy and, and Israel as well wants to see the PA um, do more there. And that's not necessarily aligned with where, um, you know, Qatar and the UAE are. Yeah, th th thank you for that. And Michael, will you, will you build on what Kate said specifically, uh, you know, talking about some of those political issues that go back um, specifically, you know, and this is a question that came in from the chat from uh, Jeff uh, Dabi, um, you know, of all the things that we're having trouble predicting, you know, the future is, is high up there on the list, um, but we know that it could easily result in um, a splintering or a factionalization in the Palestinian uh, you know, political structure, political arena, uh, in a post-Abbas uh, world, um, do you think that the Abraham Accords or the you know, relationship with the UAE or some of the others could be helpful there um, in prevailing upon the PA to increase normalization with Israel uh, or, or, or even with, you know, in partnership with the US? Um, and and could they get more involved on that? And, and, and also, you'd love to hear your comments on, on Gaza as well. On the question of um, outside influence on the PA, um, so you know the, the 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 genesis really of the break between the PA and, and the UAE right now um, is uh, a dispute between the UAE and uh, and Abu Mazen over Mohammed Dahlan. Uh, Dahlan was um, a very high up uh, Fatah official. Um, he was uh, the security. chief of security in Gaza during the Second Intifada, um, and he had a falling out with Abu Mazen. And uh, you know he's been living in exile now, I think, for over a decade uh, in Abu Dhabi. Um, and when it comes to internal Fatah politics, Dahlan is is Abu Mazen's uh, you know absolute number number one nemesis. He's he's gone out of his way to purge. Uh, Fatah of uh, any Dahlan acolytes. So, so long as Abu Mazen is there and Dahlan is in, is in Abu Dhabi, the UAE is simply not going to do anything uh, to, to benefit the PA and Abu Mazen. And, um, you know, in a, in a post-Abbas world, I'm sure that the UAE would love to see Dahlan take over. Um, I don't know that they have the influence or ability to make that, make that happen. Um, but if that were to be the case, then I think all of a sudden you would see a lot more Emirati influence on the PA and, and, and probably uh, pressure from the UAE on the PA and on Palestinians more widely to engage with Israel in a, in a more robust manner. But at the moment, the PA and Abu Mazen have been pretty resistant to, to outside pressure of all sorts, You know whether it came from the Trump administration, whether it comes from the UAE, um, so I'm not sure that any of the outside parties at the moment can really move Abu Mazen all that much on, on those specific issues. Um, when it comes to Gaza, you know, from, from my point of view and, and uh, my, my colleague Shira uh, and Evan and I wrote this in our report, Gaza should be viewed as an opportunity because 
Um, the Qataris, you know, as Kate noted, the, the Qataris and the Egyptians are, are already involved in a, in a very heavy way. Um, I think that there is a, a scenario in which the Emiratis could become more involved. They're pretty adamant that they don't want to just be the ATM for Gaza. Um, but I think that you can probably integrate them in, in, a, in a more involved way. Um, and if some of these outside countries can improve the situation in Gaza for Palestinians and obviously engage with Israel while doing so, because anything that goes on in Gaza at the end of the day has to have Israeli sign off, even if you know, the Israelis are never going to formally sign off on certain things. Sure. Um, you know, it's a good way to, to improve these relationships between Israel and other states and for normalization to improve the lot of Palestinians living in Gaza who you know, really need all the help they can get. Um, so I think that you know, Gaza should be seen in a lot of ways as an opportunity as opposed to a perpetual problem. You know, well, thank you, that, that's really helpful. We just have about a minute or two left. Um, and so I wanna offer the opportunity to take uh, you know, last words here. There are a few more questions coming in. One is to do with uh, medical tourism into Israel. Um, you know, Hadassah hospitals hope you know hosted many guests, and you know we we can uh, think about that as also a potential for you know further regional cooperation. Um, also, there was a question, Michael, about why uh, why you think the green blue water deal has failed. Um, so, if we want to you know relate briefly to those uh, two questions, um, and then I just want to ask you is this you know um, is what are we going to be celebrating next, do you think? And um, what are you deeply worried about, uh, you know, sort of, as we say, while standing on one foot, um, you know, to, to say, you know, are the Saudis going to be next or what, is there something that we could be celebrating down the line? And what do you uh, lose sleep over um, in the region? Um, Kate, we'll, we'll turn to you first and then, uh, and then to Michael. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a lot of questions there and, and not a lot of time. Um, I, I think just to, to kind of close <laughs> off the Gaza discussion, though, I would, I would say just to note, I think Michael did a great job of explaining the role of Dahlan in the view of the UAE, that he's a Gazan. And so the UAE has um, in the past wanted to make, uh, you know, somewhat implicit contingent uh, their, their support to Gaza on seeing Dahlan return in some sort of position there or have some sort of gain in his uh, um, you know, in terms of his 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 political futures, uh, be part of it. Um, what what do I think we'll see next? I actually think that we will see um, more of uh, Israel and UAE cooperating trilaterally, hopefully in the region, but also I think in Asia. I think this is um, what one thing we didn't talk about. To throw something in at the end is is how this uh, you know another area where their, um, their, their concerns or their threat picture aligns is, is, is this concern about being stuck between uh, the US and China and how difficult it is um, you know, for, for countries like the UN, UAE and, and um, Israel under pressure from the US to kind of choose between the two. Um, I do think we'll see them working more together in Asia. I think that's something that they want to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that, um, that the US should, should support as well. Um, so as much as this is not an anti-Iran coalition, it's also not an anti-China one, but I think that it, it can be leveraged in that way. Um, I think the UAE uh, does not wanna be seen whether it's in Gaza or it's uh, you know, for Israeli startups as, as kind of the wallet or the ATM. Um, it wants to look for opportunities where it can leverage Israeli technology, whether to do scale up in the UAE or take its project management experience in the energy sector, like we saw in Jordan um, or in construction and take that either east um, you know, or, or, or into Africa as well. But I think Asia will be next. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Um, one one minute, minute over. Yeah, but it's yeah just, just quickly on the, uh, you know, on, on the water deal. I didn't say that it failed. I said that it, um, it's a very successful project, but it does leave the Palestinians out, and that's that's not going to change uh, before before the agreement, uh, you know, is formally is formally concluded. Um, you know, in terms of in terms of something that uh, that we that we may see next, and something that I'm hopeful about, um, so much of the focus on in the Abraham Accords has been on Israel UAE, 
Um, the Bahrainis, in, in a lot of ways, are really eager to get involved um, in, in a more robust way. They're, they're eager to get involved in terms of bilateral deals uh, with Israel, but they're also the most enthusiastic among the Abraham Accords countries of doing things that will include the Palestinians and uh, and bring them into the equation. And so I'm hopeful that in the year ahead, um, you know, smarter smarter folks than me will will come up with ways uh, for Israel, Bahrain, and the Palestinians to uh, do some joint projects together, which you know I think will uh, really fulfill the Abraham Accords initial premise of um, strengthening normalization, but also add in this uh, this other element um, of not leaving the Palestinians out of it entirely. Okay, well, from your mouth, uh, you know, to God's ears, let's hope that those things uh, continue to happen. Um, I, I want to express my deep uh, appreciation and, and gratitude to you, Kate, and to you, Michael. Um, I always learn new things from listening to you. Uh, please follow uh, the Capital Report uh, from IPF. Uh, I invite you all to subscribe to the Arts and Newsletter, where I write on Israeli politics and the uh, Parashat Shavua, usually weekly. Um, and Kate will look out for your writings and publications through the Washington Institute. Um, this has been uh, number four in the, our series uh, on steps that need to take place to the two-state solution next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, December 22nd on a Wednesday, we will be talking about settlements uh, and the settlement enterprise, including looking at some cutting edge software that some of you may have seen already uh, through IPF and doing a virtual tour uh, of, uh, of, of, of some of the areas A, B, and C uh, to understand the lay of the land there and what are the implications for uh, settlement development and, and continuous building. Uh, so please join us next week. Um, I wanna thank everyone who came and were with us uh, this week. Obviously sponsorships are always available for this kind of work and we appreciate you supporting both the URJ and IPF. Uh, and I want to again thank uh, thank Kate and Michael, uh, and thank uh, Molly Blumenthal and Sierra De Costa for helping to put this series together. And want to wish everyone a Tzoram Tovim, a good afternoon, uh, and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.